A very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us for the online webinar on MOOC and online teaching, sharing experiences and learned lessons. Myself, Dr. Kiranjit Kaur, and I'm the moderator of today's session. This is the third webinar which is conducted as part of the Prevented Project, which is co-funded by Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And you can see both the logos on the top of your screens. The vision of this project is to see a future where every individual is aware of antibiotic resistance and is empowered with the right education to address the same. We have already conducted two webinars related to this project previously, and I hope most of you might have attended that session. Those webinars were more towards the technical side of antibiotic resistance and covered the topic of superbugs, the upcoming pandemic, and the condition and impact of antibiotic resistance on food products such as milk. However, today's webinar is more inclined towards the teaching tool tools which are used to create awareness among students through education. As we all know, COVID-19 has affected all the aspects of our life drastically and educational sector is no exception to that, that. And I'm sure all the faculty members, students who are listening to us right now will agree to that. As uh, probably I could say being from India, uh, we are very used to the chalk and board teaching, but nowadays we have to learn more and unlearn the previous things and to upgrade our own knowledge in context of making the learning to students more easy. Thus, the adoption and designing and execution of online tools has been the best solution in this direction. Therefore, we thought of utilizing this opportunity and inviting one of the experts on MOOC and online teaching from one of the consortium members of this project, Dr. Daniel from Maastricht University. Now, before going into the technical details of the session, uh, next slide, please. I would like to share the learning objectives of this webinar. So after attending this webinar, the attend you will be able to gain insights into the challenges and solutions of online learning, which I'm sure all of us are facing badly nowadays, to understand the basic steps for designing online learning and MOOCs. Also, you will be able to understand and gain insight in active learning formats of online learning, such as problem-based learning, for which Dr. Daniel is the expert in Maastricht, trust me. Uh, regarding the webinar details, this webinar is being uh, uh, utilized and being put on Zoom, and it is directly streamed on YouTube so that we can have maximum participation from the audience. And whenever we listen to any expert, all the time, the thing is that ultimately, what is the learning which we have? And to have the better learning outcome, you should interact with the speaker. Although we don't have that mode here, but I'll be the moderator and you can utilize the chat box to put your questions. And trust me, I will try to address all the queries and questions from your side. And this session will happen in the end during the last minutes of the webinar. And in order to create more awareness and to utilize this opportunity in a better way, we have recorded this session. We will be recording this session and the, ses the recorded session will be posted on the official website of Prevented, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. In case any of your family members or friends miss the chance today because of their uh, prior commitments, they can always go to these online links to undergo the training or the expert talk given by Dr. Daniel. Next slide, please. Now, before I actually hand over the, chain, the charge to Dr. Daniel Wurstjen, Program Director of the Master of Health Profession Education, MHPE program, Maastricht University, Netherlands, I would just take one more minute to introduce and give you a brief background of our expert speaker. 
Dr. Daniel studied cognitive science and has completed her PhD in educational sciences. She works at Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences, Department of Education, Research and Development at Maastricht University. Her area of expertise lies in the instructional design, problem-based learning, branded and online learning. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Daniel to share her experience on the same. And on behalf of all the audience, I would first like to thank Dr. Daniel to uh, share the presentation, share her experiences and take out time from her busy schedule. Over to you, Dr. Daniel. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Karanjit. Um, this is where I am actually at the moment in Maastricht in the Netherlands. Um, and I'm happy today to share some of our experiences and the lessons that we've learned doing uh, some online teaching and, and MOOCs. Uh, although uh, at Maastricht University, most of our programs are on-site and face-to-face, -face, we have had the same challenge lately with the COVID virus to, and we had to go online as well. So I'll come back to that uh, too. Um, I'm based in the School of Health Professions Education, um, which means that our situation is a little bit different. We, we offer a number of programs to working health professionals, uh, post-academic programs for people who want to uh, specialize more, and most of them are part-time and at least largely online. So that is where my experience comes from. Uh, we also support our own faculty here in Maastricht doing similar things in their own program. So that's, that's a role that we have as well. Uh, and we also conduct research into innovative forms of education. And we collaborate in projects like Prevented and, and other similar projects with partners. So just in case you would like to know more about the School of Health Professions Education, here are some contact details. Um, but I'd like to go on uh, with this talk now, and I'll give you a spoiler alert. My final conclusion will be that one size does not fit all. Uh, so if you came here expecting that I would have a magical solution for online learning or MOOCs that always works, I'm sorry, uh, I haven't. I'm going to share some examples with you, and I hope to show you that uh, different situations ask for different instructional designs and different solutions. Now we saw the rise of online learning and many of us thought that online learning was really going to change education. Um, I'm not sure that is true. I think online learning has advantages, but a lot of online learning still looks like this. Um, and if online learning is listening to lectures of an eminent professor, it, it is in principle not very different from listening to a professor in a lecture hall. Uh, there's nothing wrong with listening to a professor, but some of our learning theories and our research say that it might not be the optimal form of learning. So in Maastricht, we, we advocate problem-based learning, which is more like the picture on the bottom left here, with small groups of students who are actively involved in discussing problems amongst each other uh, rather than, than listening to an expert. When we were, um, we had the challenge to do some of our teaching online, uh, it meant that we had to go back to instructional design and thinking, how could we do something online uh, that is more along our own principles of active problem-based learning? Instructional design is a, a, a different field with lots of theories and models, but the basic question for me is always this, who are my target students? What should they learn? And how can they best learn it? Um, and I'm going to give you some examples to show you how we have answered those questions in different situations. 
This is my first example. We have a number of um, regular master programs who have full-time students on site in Maastricht, but who also offer a part-time track for working healthcare professionals who maybe want to specialize in preventive health or healthcare innovation, um, to name some examples. Now, for these master programs, the target students are not living in Maastricht, but they are not too far away, maybe in a circle of five or 600 kilometers. So that means that it's not unreasonable for us to ask these students to come to Maastricht now and again. And that has advantages, as I will show later on. So for these master programs, we usually have a setup where each uh, eight week course starts with a meeting in Maastricht. So the students travel to Maastricht once every two months to start a new model module and to do the exam for the previous course. All their materials are online. Uh, the, the lectures that the full-time students get are recorded so that our part-time students can watch them uh, from their own home. Uh, and in the weeks that they are not in Maastricht, they have online synchronous PBL meetings and tutorials on Fridays. So this is our solution for this kind of setting uh, where these students are working, but they have to be available on Fridays to be in synchronous meetings. The meetings look a bit like the picture you see on the bottom left or more or less like these Zoom meetings that we're all getting used to now. We meet online and if you are in a relatively small group, you can have a, an interactive discussion quite like the discussion you could have when you were all in the same meeting room. This model has been very successful uh, because it has an immediate gain for our part-time students. They can go on living at their own home, working uh, as they were always used to, but they still have the advantages of this active learning format of problem-based learning. Um, because they meet online synchronously uh, every Friday, they feel they are part of a group, they are motivated, they know each other and they support each other in um, doing this entire master program. And it helps a lot that they meet every two months uh, so that they also really know each other. There are some extra requirements, of course, as well. Um, we need some technology for these online meetings and we have learned that it works very well to prepare this and to test it beforehand. Um, generally, our teachers are more comfortable if they have a second person at their side who can solve technical problems. Uh, so much like I have in this webinar now, I know that there is somebody at my side who will solve technical problems should they occur. And that leaves me free to talk. Um, we've also learned that when we uh, are talking online, even in a small group, we need to discuss some rules for interaction, because when you're talking online, you have to take turns, you can't really talk at the same moment, uh, that doesn't work. So we need a little bit of extra time to discuss uh, these differences between face-to-face -face and online communication. But we've seen that, that most of our students and teachers get used to this quite quickly. We've seen this recently even more because as many universities all over the world, uh, when COVID struck, we've had to move all our education online. So in the last few months, we've done online education for, for all our regular bachelor and master programs as well. Um, these students are a bit different because they're, they're younger and they live in Maastricht usually. Um, but in COVID times, they couldn't come to university anyway. So we've had their materials uh, were already online. The lectures that they can follow in lecture halls here face to face were always recorded. So we already have those as well. And what, we, what was new for us in these past months is that we've moved all these online problem-based learning meetings. Uh, we've moved those to, to online meetings. We've moved 
training sessions as far as possible to online. And we've had to go to uh, doing online exams and that probably was the biggest change. It has worked a lot better than many people uh, feared uh, for one important reason, and that was that there was no other option. Um, I have colleagues who tried to do online PBL sessions with bachelor students beforehand uh, a few years ago, uh, and it was not a great success because in usual circumstances, our full-time students actually enjoy coming to the university and meeting each other and meeting the teachers, and it's just easier. But in COVID times, it was either online education or nothing else. So there was a large commitment from staff and students uh, to make this a success. What has also helped us, I think, is that we had some experience with online teaching already. So when we had to uh, move to, to do this on a larger scale, we could use the solutions that we had uh, tried out before in our part-time master programs. What has also helped, I think, is that we had easy technology and good technological support. Um, and I think an important lesson in, in this situation, but also others has been that we try to keep it simple. We try to stick to plans as much as we can and on the other hand, we've also had to accept that not everything is possible. So we've moved a large amount of our education to online in the past few months, but there are also some parts that we haven't been able to do. For example, uh, it was not very easy to uh, quickly move uh, uh, our technical skills trainings to online for our medical students or our lab uh, trainings for our biomedical students. Some of these things have been postponed uh, because there was no quick, easy solution to do that online. I have a, a third example of, of, a, of a different master program, the one that I, uh, I, I am in charge of, so I, I have a lot of experience with. And the difference here is that we have in this Master of Health Professions Education, students from all over the world. You see that this is a practical circumstance that has forced us to go for different solutions because our students really come from Japan to Colombia, from everywhere. Um, and we can't ask these students to come to Maastricht every two months or, or so. Uh, so we've gone for an option where they come uh, together for three weeks each year, three full weeks, either in Maastricht or in our partner sites in New York, Canada, or Singapore. The rest of the year, our, these students work online. Uh, and we've also had to give up uh, the idea of doing a lot of synchronous interaction because they live in many different time zones. Uh, I can schedule a session uh, with you in India because it's two time zones, but if I want to schedule a session that would allow people from Mexico and Australia to be there at the same time, it, it gets very, very difficult. So in this master program, we have the three on-site weeks that we really use very intensively, and the rest of the year, the students work um, online asynchronously on assignments that are mostly individual assignments and they work self-paced during the year. Um, here too, I think our experience is that having these on-site periods um, is a large success factor. It means that the students know each other. It also means that they have met us um, and that's, a, that's important because um, this, as staff of Maastricht University, we interact differently with students. Um, we have different expectations of students than, than they might expect uh, if they come from a completely different setting or country. Uh, what we've also uh, 
learned to do is, is to keep contact when the students are working online during the year. We try to keep in contact frequently. We try to give them intermediate guidance, intermediate feedback, sometimes even very brief uh, uh, messages just to tell them whether they're on the right track or whether they should move a little bit in another direction with their assignment. Um, that's necessary if you don't meet your students frequently because they could be going in a completely different direction than you think. What we've also learned is that flexibility is important. Uh, our students are working healthcare professionals. Uh, they do not only have their work, they also have a, a private life and lots of things happen. Some of them get sick, some of them have children, some of them uh, have to care for family members, some of them have busy periods at work. So we have to find ways to allow our students to work at their own pace. Um, and to support this, uh, we have installed a mentoring program and lots of backup options. And the mentoring is also important, we found, for our students just the fact that somebody reaches out to you two or three times a year to ask you how you're doing um, makes it more feasible for our students to continue uh, if they meet barriers. Some extra requirements as well. We, we have to work very hard, we think, uh, to make sure that our staff is visible, that students feel that they can approach our teachers when they have questions, um, that they feel um, connected, I think, to some extent. We've also learned that we have to make very, very explicit what we expect, much more so than when we meet students face to face. Uh, there's a lot of uh, detailed information that you can give when you meet face to face and when you only meet online, you have to be very, very explicit. What we've also seen is that dedicated administrative support is very important in this, in this situation because we have an intake of about 60 students each year that come from all over and we need uh, administrative support to arrange uh, this. Now I get to my, my fourth example, which is a bit different. And because I know that in the Prevented Project, we are also developing a MOOC, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, talking about our, our MOOC project. Because MOOCs, in a way, are very different from other forms of online teaching. Uh, in a MOOC, we are thinking about a very large scale course with hundreds or maybe thousands of participants. Uh, if we think at that scale, we already know that we can give very little teacher support and that we have to find ways to support participants um, as much as possible without intervention of teachers. We also know in a MOOC that the course will be fully online. Um, so that makes it even more important to be explicit and uh, to uh, be self-explaining in, in, in how the course works. Um, when we were uh, faced with the question a few years ago to develop a MOOC, uh, the university board wanted to experiment with MOOCs and asked us to develop a MOOC on problem-based learning. Now, that was a bit tricky because problem-based learning focuses on this interactive small group format of learning. And we felt it would be very strange if we just provided lectures and reading materials, uh, put it online, and that would be it. Uh, it's in a way uh, contradictive with the ideas behind problem-based learning. So we tried to find ways in a MOOC to make it interactive without actually having a lot of teacher support. Uh, what we did is that we asked participants um, 
to form groups by themselves. And we found a platform that supported that. Uh, in these groups of participants, they worked on PBL problems. So we gave them a problem description and we asked them to discuss this problem, uh, to uh, read some of the resources that we provided, to watch some video clips, to maybe search for additional information, to discuss what they had learned and what might be um, the answers to their learning questions. Um, this is, for a MOOC, quite a particular design, uh, but it worked quite well, and I'll show you some of our results. Um, we conducted this MOOC twice. Um, the first time was a, a, a really large-scale run where we had nearly 3,000 participants, but as you can see, only about 10% of those participants actually finished the course. It looks very small, but in the context of MOOC, this is actually quite normal. Uh, MOOCs in general have a completion rate of between five and 10%. So we're actually even at the higher side here. What we also saw is that the, 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 the part of the participants that, that took the effort to uh, form groups, and those are the, the 794, we saw that the, the completion rate there was a lot higher, even almost a third. So that, that is quite high in context of a MOOC. So probably um, the fact that they felt part of the group um, made them more committed to completing the MOOC. percentages even a, a little bit higher and as you can see from the from the graph below we really had par participants from all over the world um, what we saw also is that um, the participants who stayed in the course uh, were very very positive so we sent them a questionnaire halfway and at the end of the course and we also asked them to some open questions, and we got a lot of really enthusiastic reactions uh, from people who were very happy to learn more about problem-based learning, also from people who were very happy to interact with fellow students. Informally, I know that some of the groups that were formed in this MOOC have continued to be in contact um, afterwards. We also looked at the assignments that they sent in for research purposes. We did not give feedback to the assignments, but, but we looked at them afterwards for research purposes to see uh, what the quality of these assignments was. And we saw that the quality varied a lot. Uh, some of the groups remain very superficial and their assignments were not very good. Uh, some of them were ex extremely good and a lot better than we could have ever imagined. And that's, I think, also typical for a MOOC because you have uh, participants that vary a lot in their background knowledge, vary a lot in their commitment. So some of them will do very good and some of them will just do the minimal. Um, so this is, I think, normal in, in terms of MOOC. We got some very, very good um, assignments as well. Our conclusion of this MOOC project uh, is that um, we have typically in a MOOC a lot of participants, but that also a large percentage of, this, of these participants um, leaves very quickly. Uh, Personally, I don't think that is necessarily a problem because a lot of these participants might only be interested in a part of our course or in one part of the information that we provide. And they might come into our course, just look at that little bit and leave again and not complete the course. That's fine. 
Uh, maybe they don't, they don't even do enough to get a, a certificate of participation. Well, if they don't need it, that's also fine. Um, what we see is that people who are really interested and committed can be very, very positive and happy uh, in a MOOC because they already know that there will be very little teacher support. There's also a small group of people in our MOOC, and I suspect in any MOOC though, um, that would have liked to learn more, that would have liked to participate more, but that, uh, who, that who didn't succeed in doing so. Maybe because they didn't have the technical skills to, to uh, go online and to use all the online tools that, that we provided. Uh, maybe because they, they didn't understand what to do or how to interact with the materials. And that's, I think, a group that we should worry about. So I would advocate that, that there should be at least some limited uh, amount of teacher support for people who encounter problems and, and want to go on. What we saw, just a summary of success factors and, and for, for our MOOC is that, that what made this happen is that we had a very enthusiastic and daring team uh, who were willing to try out things that they had never done before. What also helped, I think, is that we had support from Maastricht University to, to do something like that, because we didn't know beforehand whether this MOOC was going to be a success or not. Um, again, I think we tried to do in this MOOC something that was quite creative and innovative, but we also tried to keep it simple. And one of the uh, examples of keeping it simple is that, that we discussed the issue of assessment. Um, and in the end, we decided not to do any formal assessment and just to provide a certificate of participation for anybody who completed the MOOC, uh, because our goal was to reach out to a wide uh, public to maybe, uh, as publicity for Maastricht University a bit, but also to spread our knowledge about problem-based learning. And we didn't want to really formally assess. We didn't want to put a percentage of how many questions you had to have right or something like that. It was just not important. So we provided only a, a certificate of participation and that made it a lot easier for us, of course. What also helped in this context uh, is that we put participants in the lead and we allowed them to choose what they wanted to study and how much time they wanted to spend on this uh, based on their own interest. We uh, allowed them to form their own groups uh, and they formed groups of people who were in similar circumstances. So we had a group of uh, people involved in medical education in different countries, but we also had a group of people involved in secondary school teach teaching in different countries. And we allowed uh, the participants to, to make these groups themselves. We also allowed them to, to decide on tools. We had large discussions on should we force participants to have synchronous or asynchronous contexts. And in the end, we decided to let them decide for themselves. And we saw that some of the groups in the MOOC organized Zoom or sessions like this or Google Hangout sessions and others just use asynchronous discussion forums or, or Google Drive to work together. We also did a few things to support team formation and, and trust building. We asked these teams to, uh, to discuss amongst themselves what their goals were and how they wanted to reach them. So that was another uh, small measure that we took. Um, it didn't take any teacher time because we just provided a list of questions and asked them to think about these. Organizing a MOOC uh, like this uh, does of course ask for time and money because MOOCs require a different technical platform. 
uh, and require uh, time investment to really think about how to design the MOOC and, and how to execute it. Um, the other thing I think that is important in the context of a MOOC is that you have to accept that you cannot cater for everyone. Uh, it's quite simple. If you have small scale teaching with a lot of teacher support, you can try to help all the students. If you have a large scale MOOC with very limited teacher support, uh, you just have to accept um, that you cannot help everyone. Um, I'm getting it to my sort of overall uh, lessons learned, trying to summarize uh, what we have learned and what we think is important. Um, firstly, I think we should try to think about why we want to move education online or why we want to organize a MOOC. There can be very different goals. Uh, when we had to move our education online for COVID, uh, anything that we could achieve was a gain because there was no other option. Uh, when we think about moving education online for students that are already here, it's different. Uh, there's no gain. There's no reason why we should move the education for regular bachelor students to an online setting. If we think about the context of a MOOC, um, if our goal is to reach out to a wide public and we try to make the entrance level as low as possible, we try to adjust our teaching materials so that they are understandable for anyone. Uh, I know other universities that organize MOOCs to attract students to their university as a sort of a stepping stone to a specific bachelor or master program, then it's different. Then you're trying to attract students that are at that level. And you might also want to invest in formal assessment and credits uh, for students uh, to take away from, from that MOOC. So the, the why question has important consequences for how you design your online uh, teaching. Then I think we always went back to this question of who are we targeting, what should they learn, and how can they best learn it? These questions are related. Um, different things are you learn in different ways. For us, because we wanted uh, in the MOOC to, we wanted our participants to learn about problem-based learning, it was important that the instructional design of the MOOC was similar to the setup of problem-based learning. Um, in other situations, that's, that's different. Uh, so you get to different solutions. My third main learning point is prepare. We've learned over the way, over the years, I think that uh, online teaching, uh, requires more preparation beforehand and usually less time when it's running. Uh, in the MOOC that was most extreme, uh, we spent a year and a half preparing our MOOC. And when it was running, uh, I spent maybe three or four hours a week on it. Uh, in a face-to-face -face course, that's often the other way around. I spend relatively little time beforehand. Uh, and when it's running, I know that I'll be busy with it almost full time because students are asking questions and interacting with, with me the whole time. So prepare and prepare beforehand. Um, I'd like to just finish with a, a summary also of of what we've seen as advantages and disadvantages of teaching online. Just to summarize, uh, teaching online can have many advantages. It's flexible, uh, people can participate from anywhere, they don't have to travel here. Uh, it is flexible in timing, people can work at their own pace. Uh, it, you can address a wider audience. Uh, for us, that's often working professionals. 
uh, and international students, but in the master program, for instance, it's also a large advantage that, that we can mix professions. We have students that are nurses, students that are doctors, students that are physiotherapists, and they're in the same course um, learning with each other. So these are important, uh, can be important advantages. There are also some disadvantages to teaching online. We need technology and technology can always fail. Uh, teachers and students may not always be willing to engage in online learning and they might not always be able. Um, you need some technical skills to uh, learn online. You probably also need some skills in uh, how to interact online. It's just a little bit different. One of the main disadvantages is also that there is a lack of body language, even in synchronous contexts. Um, the communication is not as easy as when we're in the same room. Uh, we have to get used to taking turns. Uh, we have less, the interaction is less easy. We have to take extra efforts to interact with each other. And it might be more difficult to involve everyone. So it, it, we've learned that if we want a session to be interactive, we have to make the groups uh, a little bit smaller if we are doing it online. If I'm in a face-to-face -face room, I can uh, facilitate an interactive discussion also with 10 students. But when I do it online, the limit is somewhere at six or seven. And if I have more students in an online setting, it's, it it's becomes more difficult. An important um, disadvantage of, of online learning that many people uh, don't think about is also the lack of social contacts. Um, students often enjoy uh, the social interaction, the coffee breaks, the just to meet each other. And for teachers, this is the same. And I think we shouldn't underestimate how important it is for our students uh, to meet each other and to meet us. When we're moving uh, to online teaching, this can also require extra attention. A few words on MOOCs then to end with, um, because MOOCs are different from other forms of online teaching. MOOCs have the advantage that they are, are, are often free and that they can serve a very large audience. In principle, anyone can join, so you can address a very wide audience. The downside of that is that there can be an extreme variety between participants. And when we design this course, we have to be aware of the fact that some of the materials that we put in might be very difficult for some participants and far too easy for other participants. Another large advantage, a disadvantage of MOOCs is that we, we cannot offer a lot of teacher support. Um, something that, that we just have to take into account. And I think we have to take into account for MOOCs that a lot of the students will be less committed. So that's why uh, the, the completion rates of MOOCs are usually quite low. This is a summary of the questions that we've been addressing in this talk. Um, I've just put it here to, in, in a list. Huh? We, these are the, 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 the questions that we've asked. Why do we want to go online? Who are the target participants? What are they going to learn? But then also, how can they learn this best? Which learning activities can we plan for the participants? Do we stick to uh, recorded lectures, reading materials, uh, and nothing else? Or do we include some self-tests, some assignments that they can send in, uh, or uh, things like that that make it a, a little bit more interactive? What is the role of teachers? Uh, if you have uh, 
teacher time available, it can be very helpful to involve them heavily and to make sure that teachers keep in contact with students. But if there is not the possibility of offering this teacher support, then it's also something to take into account beforehand. Um, yeah, we've talked about the other questions as well. Should, should participants be assessed and how, which resources do you need? This more or less concludes my talk. I hope that um, with these examples and our lessons learned, I've been able to show you that one size does not fit all, that it is important to really think about who you're targeting and what the situation is. I'll give over the word to Dr. Ranjit to ask some of the questions that have come in, I hope. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Daniel. First of all, I would like to request you to kindly do the stop sharing so that people can see your face. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, thank you for being on time also. It's exactly 3.45, so that's great. So we have good time for interactions. We have got uh, five, six questions from students um, and from faculties. Uh, so probably the questions are a mix, like they are for online teaching as well as they are for MOOC. So I will try to be as clear as possible in my questions. Uh, okay, so first question is that you mentioned that there are some platforms, specific platforms, which can help students to interact during the online course. So this is not related to MOOC, this is normal online course like some interactions through group, groups can happen during uh, the classes. So uh, what special platforms are you talking about? Is it like, uh, because when the teacher is taking a class, it can be on Zoom or Google Classroom, these kind of platforms, or there are other special softwares which you are talking about? Um, yeah, there are uh, single tools like Zoom or Google Hangouts for our uh, online teaching in, in, our, in our master programs, we also use the university's learning management system. Mm -hmm. uh, until last year, we used Blackboard. Uh, and since this year, we use Canvas. Um, these learning management systems are, um, a, in, my, in my head, I see them as a collection of tools. And so Canvas as a learning management system offers me the possibility to um, show the structure of the course, to store the learning materials that I have, to also uh, give the links to the recorded lectures or the links to, this, to the meetings that we have. Uh, and then for those meetings, sometimes we, we use Zoom, sometimes we use other forms of virtual classrooms. But learning management systems are sort of a collection of these tools. You can do a lot of that also if you if you use all the Google tools together, for example. You could have a website that posts the schedule of your course and then the, uh, po you could share the materials in Drive. It, it helps for, for an online course to, to have a one point of entrance for your students, that they know if I go there, I will find the links to the Zoom session, but also the materials that I need to study, and maybe a discussion forum where I, I can post questions, uh, things like that. So for that kind of purpose, a learning management system is, is handy. Um, for MOOCs, there are different platforms, and that, that has to do with, with the really large amount of participants there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, should I? Okay, so, uh, yeah, so second uh, question was that uh, during MOOCs or during online courses, so I think these are two different things, so probably you can ask for two different categories as well in this question, uh, that how the assessments are ensured, like, for example, we are doing online teaching and we, even if we make a Google form or something like this, the students may do the, you know, cheating or, I don't know, copy pasting from the internet and these kind of things. So how do you ensure that the assessment is correct or are there any specific um, measures which we should take, a teacher to take to ensure the, um, that, that the content is coming only from student rather than a copy paste from internet? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question because um, 
there is also a link with our educational views. Um, we, uh, for some of our, uh, uh, when we had to move the, the, the assessment for our bachelor programs to online in the COVID times, we used specific assessment software. Uh, our, our bachelor students have uh, some uh, large multiple choice exams. Uh, if you move those uh, online, you want to make sure that it's the student themselves who do the, who does this test and not somebody else. So there is specific testing software uh, where the student uh, is asked to uh, have their webcam on during the test. And then we had we organized supervisors uh, who who supervised groups of 10 to 20 students to make sure that they stayed behind their computer and that they didn't go uh, to the bathroom in between. And, okay. and so, uh, so there is specific software that you can use for online tests, which allows you to check that it's that student behind the computer. And they would be asked to, to show their student identification beforehand so that we could compare the picture with the student and you could make sure it was mm -hmm. that student. There is also mm -hmm. software to make sure that they cannot, uh, the software also uh, can put the computer in a mode where they cannot access internet at the same time. Oh. Uh, that is, that, that's possible. It takes quite a lot of organization to do so. Um, yeah. in, in, in the master program that I direct, we have taken a different approach. Um, we feel uh, that it's important for our students to be active learners, to apply what they learn. So we don't really use multiple choice tests. We give them assignments. So for example, I ask my students in my, my, the course that I'm currently directing is about curriculum design. The first assignment is for students to, anal to describe and analyze their own curriculum. When they send okay. in this assignment to me, it goes to a, a plagiarism software so that I, I can see that it's not completely copied. And anyway, it is, it is very specific. I ask them to reflect on their own mm -hmm. curriculum and what is good and, and less good about it. It's very easy for me to see that they have put their own thinking and their own yeah. thoughts uh, in this. Uh, so then I don't need all the complicated software, uh, but it's, it's, it's an assignment that takes more time to review. Yeah. Uh, um, but that's, and that's where the educational vision, that's why I, I made that link. It really depends on, on what kind of assessment you, you have in mind. Yeah. In the MOOC, uh, we took a different approach because we felt um, we didn't want to put a threshold on, on what or how much people learned. We felt that um, for people who knew nothing about problem-based learning, it would be very nice if they just got the basics. And for people yeah. who already knew a lot, they would learn different things. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the end, we decided to just, uh, just hand out a certificate of participation for people who needed to show that they had completed the course, but we didn't, we didn't invest in organizing assessment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So probably you are saying the teachers should also be very smart enough in designing the question so that the students don't have an option to go and check the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it also has, that's, that's another way. I think uh, a lot, even in our multiple choice exams in the med in the medicine curriculum, for example, a lot of the questions start with a lot of, a little case description. Uh -huh. uh, so it's uh, you're you're a GP and uh, Mr. X walks into your yes. uh, room and and he this is his question and and then it's it's less easy to directly uh, look up the answer. Yeah. But the other reason behind this is is our idea that. Um, it's more meaningful to ask people to apply their knowledge 
than to just ask them to recite facts. Yeah, yeah that's it, true. It has to do also with your idea of what good learning is. Yeah, no, that's true. Okay. Uh, so coming to the next question is how can we make MOOCs more interactive? Any examples if you have, you have shared a bit, but uh, just uh, from students' point of view, how when can we make uh, it more interactive? It is a very inter interesting question and very relevant because a lot of MOOCs have actually uh, failed because mm -hmm. they're really only, huh? if, if yeah. the only thing is, listening to a lecture and reading then it's not much different from sending people a good book yeah uh, so there are some forms of interaction that can be automatic uh, there's a lot been a lot of research also into things like self-testing for example uh, you 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 provide some uh, recorded lectures or some reading materials about a topic and then uh, a list of multiple choice questions just to check for yourself whether you've understood the topic. Uh, that's quite a, an easy way to make it a little bit interactive and it doesn't require teachers to be there. Mm -hmm. Another way to, to try to make it interactive is to um, ask students to post on a discussion forum and then they can read and react to each other. Okay. Mm. Um, now, I have to say about discussion forums that, that um, it's not very easy to make them lively. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if uh, you have to do a little bit extra, I think, to make sure that, that students actually take the effort to post on a discussion forum. Mm. One one option that we used during the MOOC is that we told students we are not going to react to everything on the discussion forum, but we will read them. And once a week, we will organize a 10 minute Google Hangout session and we will briefly discuss some of the important issues of that week. Okay. And for us, that was a way to um, show students that we were interested yeah uh, and and to give sort of a, a general reaction to important questions it's it's more or less like we are doing now we are doing a webinar mm -hmm. i can't talk to everyone listening to the webinar but we can have a little bit of interaction to answer some questions so there are limited forms using assignments is another one and so but that depends mm -hmm. we we asked students to apply we asked students to, to read about problem-based learning and then try out uh, for themselves to design a PBL problem for their own uh, setting, for example. And then yeah. we, we gave them the option to send that in and to also review the problems that other participants had been designing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so coming to the second last question, uh, somebody asked that uh, Dr. Helmut Brand, uh, ah. uh, he asked, yeah, so he asked that, uh, what is the cost of production and uh, participation in a MOOC course? Well, it can be very, very different. Uh, depends okay. on, on, on how adventurous uh, you want to be, yeah? Um, some of the headers, there are technical costs for the platform mm -hmm. and there are uh, costs for for the staff that is involved okay mm -hmm. the technical costs uh, range some of the MOOC platforms are free free to use uh, okay. often the consequence is that the content that you place there uh, is then belongs then to the MOOC platform so you, yeah. you give away the right mm. to your teaching materials. Yeah. Uh, sometimes that is no problem. And then you can make use of a free MOOC platform. There are free MOOC platforms available. Um, the platform that we use is, is a dedicated platform that also supports uh, group-based learning. 
that we needed because we wanted this PVL move. Uh, that costs, cost I think, between 10 and 15,000 euros a year. Okay. So, so then you're talking about a reasonable amount of money. Mm -hmm. The staff costs is a different thing because um, they can also range, like if, if, if you are just posting teaching materials that you already have, mm -hmm. the staff cost can be quite limited. Yeah. The staff time can be enormous if you, if you try something wildly different. Uh, in our case, uh, it took quite a lot of staff involve, involvement because we had never designed a MOOC before and we wanted to be very innovative in our design of the MOOC and all the teaching materials had to be specifically made. And on top of that, the university board wanted, to, wanted that all the faculties were involved. So we invested a lot of time also in involving uh, people from all over the university. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of that is also that, that we have involved people of, of all the faculties and that there's been a lot of interesting discussions about yeah. how we teach and what is important in how we teach. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that was yeah. a specific for the situation. Okay. Uh, so coming to the last question, uh, it says that uh, uh, for the MOOC courses, we normally, like you were saying, that we wanted it to be innovative, so we involved uh, different faculties. But is it possible, like we can, uh, in a MOOC course, we can use the already pre-made YouTube videos and we use those links? Or is this, is this uh, not, uh, you know, uh, something which is ethical? So what is your call on that? Um, you, you have to look at who has the right, huh? I think, mm -hmm. and, and the rules, the, the legal rules in, in different countries are different, but I know that for the okay. Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, link to any video that is freely available on YouTube. Okay. Uh, because it is publicly available already. Yeah. What is not allowed is to download that video from YouTube and then upload it in a different platform uh, because okay. then you might be violating uh, the rights okay. of people uh, who have recorded that video. Mm -hmm. So if you want to download and, and upload in a different platform, you have to look at the licensing rights. And um, yeah. these days there's a... Um, a Creative Commons license. So many, many uh, colleagues around the world who, who develop online teaching materials, put a Creative Commons license on the material that that might that states that it may be reused for educational purposes. Yeah. For yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. So it, any materials that have a Creative Commons logo, you could probably also use. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very valid point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In so, terms of, of, of investment, I think mm -hmm. it's a very good idea to use videos that are already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there is so much very good teaching material already available that exactly. it's not always necessary for us to see our own mm -hmm. face and record mm -hmm. a new video. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm very much in favor of using what is there. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, that, that uh, brings us to the end of the session. So uh, Dr. Daniel, any message from your side uh, to the audience? Uh, well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, it's, um, I enjoy online education. I think the message that I would uh, like to give is uh, just try out. Uh, ask your students or your participants what they thought and try something else next time and experiment. Yeah. 
yeah that that says it all yeah doing and uh, break the monotony so that the students are also not bored and you are also not bored okay so thank you very much dr daniel for your precious time and thank you for all the participants for being there and we look forward to meet you with our next webinar which is approaching soon and um, yeah thanks for the preventive team which is working behind the technical team and stay home and stay healthy during the covid time hope this time goes uh, as early as possible but we should go on with the online teaching as uh, we have got a lot of uh, inspiration from dr daniel thank you very much dr daniel and uh, uh, that brings us to the end so bye bye and take care everyone